Uh, Chairman, I'd like to welcome uh, the IFE and the ICMSA here um, uh, to the meeting today. Um, look, I suppose a lot will be said here today, uh, you know, about the situation. I feel that in relation to farming and yeah, in relation to the dairy sector, the goalposts are changing almost every day of the week. So no farmer can plan no dairy farmer. That's what they tell me, and yeah, and I'm more on the sector side of it. I mean, I meet dairy farmers every day of the week, and I work with them uh, down through the years. If the goalposts change every day of the week, and if the European legislation and local government legislation keeps changing, that means the farmer must change to, to, to meet those needs. Um, during all this debacle, and that's all the best way I could call it, uh, in relation to derogation, every politician in the country was running down to Timothy, and I actually felt I was making a fool of the farmers below there, because God knows, and they thought there was some hope, because they had done, they had done what needed to be done in relation to Irish agriculture, and it meant, it, it meant for nothing. And I felt that, you know, this is, they'll say this is European legislation, but we, we're in Europe. And it looks like the French now have woke up, and the Germans have woke up. And I think there may be changes coming. And I plead with you as an organisation, and God knows, and I, I'm a member of the IFA, so I'm not an ICMSA, sorry about that, because I don't make the calls, or like, I don't have making calls, I did long, long, one time a day with my, with my bare hands, but that, that time has changed. But I fight hard for farmers. And that fight is not going on in Europe today. It's not going on by our own politicians in Europe. And I felt that our leaders didn't do us any justice in this. While they may say it was a European, European legislation, they were point, finger pointing, one finger pointing at the other and the other finger pointing and a kind of fighting locally and trying to get it, this thing, this thing is gonna happen, it's gonna get across the line. But if we make a bit of a fuss and a fooster might sound good and it's not good enough. And do you think, you know, um, I mean, like, just, just farmers' livelihoods are under severe pressure, and, and I, I speak to them every day of the week at last. Christmas, 12 months, a farmer rang me, and he was investing on a, a robot milking power, and you know, know a lot of farmers have invested quite a lot in, in, in recent times, and they had the VAT crisis, mm -hmm. you name it, everything will be thrown at them, just to make sure that a farmer can't grow, or a young person that wants to come on and make changes, or not allowed to make changes. But he said to me, Last Christmas, 12 months, that he was thinking of buying uh, Robert, pa or, you know, Parler, and, you know, set up. He had one already, so you'll see he's a substantial farmer to do that, but he had invested quite a lot. And he asked me for my advice, and I hate to stop anyone from investing, but I, I told him what is coming on, on online and what is coming down the road. And he said to me, you know, there's got to be changes in this because the po political system out there led him to believe that. There will be changes against it. I said, well, maybe I'm wrong. And if I do, I'll put my two hands up in there. But I wasn't wrong. And he was lucky, man. He contacted me after he said he didn't invest. And it is a sad situation. It's a terrible sad situation. The thing that I couldn't advise him and say, come on, grow. There's a big family in there. And he has youngsters coming, coming their way. But I couldn't. I couldn't. If I wanted to tell him the truth, I could have fibbed him. And I felt that a lot of farmers were being fibbed. And that there wasn't enough action done by this government to try and swing the hand of the, of, of, of the European legislators. No, as I said, others might do that. And do you think, have we any confidence going forward, if we have the same setup going forward, that we're not going to go from 220 to 170? Do you think, have we that confidence in this government that, that's what, that they'll fight for you to make sure that that won't happen? And that's what, that's what it's down to. Enough is enough. That's the IFA's slogan. And I fully agree with it. Enough is enough. But we have no backbone in this country to fight for the farmer, whether it be a dairy or a supplement. There's no backbone. And the, the Greens today are wagging the tail of Irish government. And God knows you've got to praise them, lads. They're doing a hell of a bloody good job. But what I'm seeing, if Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael and they won't wake up and start backing the Irish farmer, the hard-working Irish farmer, that produces pristine, green, good quality land and good quality products. And stop looking at, 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 at what we're bringing in from abroad. We, that's all we're doing. We have this habit in this country is block everything to come into this country. We'll make sure we bring it in the back door from some other country, like the Brazilian beef or whatever, and we could go on forever. So I, I ask you that question. Have you the confidence, confidence with the current structure that we have that they're going to fight to make sure we don't go from 220 to 170 and we don't have people going around another year or two fooling farmers down in Timonique and fooling farmers all over the place and going nowhere? Can you answer me that question? Yeah, I suppose um, a couple of comments I'll make on that, Chair, Chairman, and thanks, Deputy, for, for, for your contribution. Um, 
Has your boat gone up? Well, I think farmers, have, farmers were always awake to the dangers in this, but I think it's the frustration at, at, at the political classes not listening to the concerns we had. That's what really has, uh, you know, uh, really put, it, it's, it put huge pressure on farmers over the last number, a number of years. And particularly if you look at the way the derogation was handled from, from April 2022, when it was announced as a fait accompli, and the commissioner, we finished up in September with the commissioner coming over. Not did he think for a second of visiting a farm, and there was a number of them, right in the, uh, within half an hour of Dublin, to see best practice. And I think that frustrated farmers in a huge way. And I think it undermined the confidence of farmers in probably the commission in particular, to come and see what best practice is in this country, to visit a derogation farmer that was, a, that was impu uh, uh, implementing all the measures in the Chagas Mac Curve and, and showing best practice. And I think it, it shattered farmers' confidence in, in their belief that they're going to get a, a fair bang for their book in terms of how the review of this Nitrates Action Programme is going to be handled. And I mean, we, TJ Maher said 50 years ago when we were going into Europe, that it was our grass-based system that gave us an advantage in how we could compete in terms of producing our product and selling it. We have the highest labour costs in Europe. We have the highest energy costs in Europe. And if we're going to be able to compete selling our product, we've got to retain the advantage that our grass-based system gives us. And all we're looking for is an opportunity to demonstrate that to the powers that be and time to show that the measures that we're taking and we're implementing and our farms will deliver. And I suppose in answer to your question, Deputy, um, we're definitely at the very, very least frustrated um, and, and we want to see a greater level of engagement with farmers around how this review is, uh, is conducted. And uh, you have to include Chagas, the EPA in it as well. And I believe, I'm 100% clear on this, it's a red line issue for us that if the industry comes together, the process and industry comes on board, and with the support of our government and politicians, I believe it can be delivered. And it won't be for the want of, want of uh, uh, action on our behalf here tonight, whether it's ourselves or the ICMSA. That'll come on automatically, you when you speak. Yeah, so I just, just to, 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 there's just one point I, I would add to that as well. Like, it's often said to us that oh, we're one of only two or three or four countries that has a derogation, which is the case. But it's often said like we have to like almost apologize for having a derogation. The reason we have a derogation is because of our grass-based system, in that we can grow we can grow much we can grow grass like no other country in the UK. We we, we have a completely different system. And I think we have to get away from this thing saying, well, we're the only country and you know the Netherlands have it, the Netherlands have it, they're losing it, Denmark has it under review. Like we're completely different from those countries. We don't and we don't have um, an easy way to export, sorry, to to be it uh, AD uh, um, infrastructure that's not in Ireland at the moment, it may be in the future, it's not here at the moment really. Uh, we don't and we don't have, you know huge amounts of, of tillage ground, which they have in other countries, uh, like, like we live a much lower level of grassland. So, and the other thing to remember, I think, is that, like Francie has said, it, if we lose this derogation, like our grass-based system, we will move away from the grass-based system because we don't have, we, it, like, it's not a competitive advantage anymore. It's allowing us to be able to compete internationally with other dairy producers. Because we don't have, we, as, as the President has said, we, have the, we, we don't have any other advantage. We're actually disadvantaged than everything else. Because we're a high cost economy to do business in. Whether you're in farming, or you're in hospitality, or whatever you're in. It's a high cost economy. And that's a fact. The, the, and I suppose finally, if we want farmers to do more, like if we take away the derogation, and we, the, first of all, the derogation farmers are operating at a much higher level in terms of the level of requirements that's asked of them than non-derogation farmers. And that's right, that's understandable. They're operating at a, at, a, at a higher level. But if we take away the derogation, or if Europe takes away the derogation, well, we're going to remove the, the, we have these group of farmers who are doing all these extra measures. So what, well, they'll, you'll lose the goodwill completely of farmers as well. And they'll be, they'll be making a lot less money. So there's, you know, how do you actually finance the extra measures? 
So I think that it's, it's, it's a very complex issue and simplifying it like and almost threatening to say we're going to lose derogation because well only a couple of other countries have it. I think that's not, going, that's not a sensible way, it's not a, pr a practical way to assess it and also it, 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 it's not something that farmers will, in, will respond positively in my view. You're asking about can we confidence in the political system. I mean, we were involved in Cork last April, 12 months, and we started this campaign because we could see where it was going, and we got onto politicians, and we started up an awareness campaign, and it gained momentum after a number of months. But unfortunately, like a lot of the harm in the stuff was done in the previous year that we didn't know anything about, but we did seriously feel left down by the government of the day. Um, they didn't bat hard enough for us when, when the derogation was being got. And the narrative from, from the officials was, look, we had to agree we were lucky to get it. They were, they were four months late getting it. And my understanding is they were so late was because they were waiting for EPA reports that were delayed over six months. So the whole thing was you were being backed into a corner and then they agreed to stuff that in reality we couldn't achieve. So there's a huge lack of confidence in what happened at that juncture. And we were backpedaling then for the rest of the next 18 months and then it accumulated, it, it moved on then to the situation where the EPA then were, took months and months to produce their report to give us the final say on which parts of the country or if any of the country would go down to 220. And then it went all the way to nearly the middle of October before the department wrote to farmers to tell them they had to reduce their stocking density in different parts. Of, and I mean, we have a seasonal calving system and a grass-based system. Fellas, plans are made in January, February, March and April for the following year. So we had a situation in where fellas were backed into a corner. You can see how it came to light then. It came to light first in the land market nearly 18 months ago when fellas in the know realised there was a huge problem here. It exploded. And then the second thing, it collapsed the market for replacement stock, for dairy stock, overnight. Okay. And that's, that, that's massive asset destruction to farmers who built up businesses okay. over years. And they're really sore over it really sore like okay. and I mean this thing has come up to the political agenda and, and we're delighted it has and now we have to pull together here and make sure this thing is protected and Tyg is absolutely right talking about a derogation is, a, is a, that we're the only ones getting it is just nonsense okay. we have such okay, a different system a brief comment Dennis and then I've moved to the next speaker yeah I suppose look at the, the, the main thing that we need to make sure doesn't happen is what we signed up to in the review of the derogation didn't make sense as I said, like we weren't caught by an increase in nitrates in the water. Most of the country was caught by a risk of becoming eutrophic. Now, I can go across the road there and there's a risk I'll get knocked down, but I mightn't get knocked down. And that's where the problem was. Uh, and I suppose in the meantime then, we have two massive issues that's been highlighted already. What do we need to do to improve this and how do we need to sort it? We need extra slurry storage. Planning and TAMs are both clogged up the minute we've lost a full... 14 months now, heading for 15 months with no shovels in the ground because of lack of planning and lack of TAMS approval. Um, what's happening in ASAP areas is, is, is absolutely disheartening farmers because we've ASAP areas where they're getting one-to-one -one advice, the right measure has been put in the right place, water quality is improving in the majority of these areas, yet they were still cut. So how can you justify signing up to something that even though the, the, your local catchment the farmers have all come together, done the right thing. Everybody in their catchment has done the right thing. The water quality has improved, yet you're still caught. We're learning. We, we have real great knowledge in the country from the agricultural catchments programme as regards the issues that are causing the problem, uh, what, what the best measures to fix the problem, yet those are not the measures that are being implemented. So I think that's where the frustration is coming. Even if the right thing is done and the water quality improves, you're still caught. Like, how can you stand over that? Like, that's really frustrating. John, Just a very brief point, John. I suppose. We, you know, I think Dennis mentioned it earlier. We have probably the derogation farms have 50 more requirements on them in order to meet, in order to farm at that level of farming. They're heavily inspected. But I think the frustration out there amongst farmers is, you know, that the, the level of regulation is really trying to cho choke the sector. And while the current generation might put up with it, like the, the next generation won't. I think this is this is critical from our perspective. You know, we have a hugely innovative modern dairy sector out there, globally recognised. And we're in serious danger from a generation new point of view of destroying that sector unless we cop ourselves on or, um, chairperson. Okay. 